I appreciate you coming today. Uh, some of you, I see new faces, so I appreciate that. We have been doing a leadership speaker series for four years now, and we've brought in a number of um, leaders throughout the community and in elected office to share with us some of the things that made them leaders, some of the things that they probably didn't know was going to lead them in leadership positions. Uh, in my thoughts, in my mind, uh, the most difficult thing to do is not just be a public servant like we are, but to be elected to serve the public. That's a greater responsibility, and it's, it's um, all inspiring when someone takes on that role. And today, um, Recorder O'Connor, he took on that role, and he was elected in 2016 to serve his first term. And, but prior to him becoming recorder, um, he served as a volunteer in the Jesuit Volunteer Corps where he was a legal advocate at part of Solutions Legal Clinic in the Bronx, New York. In that capacity, he worked with veterans, immigrants, homeless individuals, and individuals stricken by poverty. Now, he graduated from Wright State University, undergrad, but had got his law degree from the University of Syracuse Law College of Law. And he had a number of, of achievements that I probably would never have gotten when I was a student. Um, he was a law alumni scholarship recipient. He was a member of the Dean's List, that I was, I have to say that. Uh, <laughs> um, he was vice president of student body and recipient of the General Electric uh, Student Leadership Award. So even at a younger age, he was clearly demonstrating some leadership uh, uh, capacities. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to leave you with was something that um, was interesting that I read about him and his background is, yes, he served, with, he worked with the prosecutor's office in the juvenile division, but the last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, the um, recorder contributed to the American Association of Matrimonial Lawyers amicus brief, and that brief was one that approached the Supreme Court to rule in favor of marriage equality. Now, I know at that time that was something that was, um, uh, it took some guts to do because the environment was not um, conducive to it at, at that time. So again, just serving the public and being willing to put himself out there. So I appreciate you coming today and talk about the things you've done to, to help us lead. And can you guys help me welcome you? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. Well, thanks everybody for being here and, and good afternoon. Um, it, it's good to be here today to discuss my journey into public service and, and why it matters so much to me, our community and the state of Ohio. And thank you to Orville and the uh, Leadership in Government Public Service Speaker Series uh, for an opportunity to share my thoughts and, and talk about the things that I've done and what's led me to this point. And I think, you know, if you ask any person in a job field why they do what they're doing, you will get a wide variety of responses. People in the public sector are certainly no different. And it's important that when you ask this question to your elected officials, your representatives, uh, it's important to ask that question because their answer tells you a lot about not only who they are as leaders, but also who they are as people. And you know, an important question is, why do you do what you do? And my journey into public service, my story is quite simple actually. I was raised to understand that it's not just my duty, but also my responsibility to help those in need. My mom spent her career as an educator, empowering future generations to be the best they can be both as individuals and as members of our communities. And through this service, she modeled for me what it looks like to devote your life to giving back and creating a community to be proud of. And it's this lesson that I've carried with me which first inspired me to become active in politics and public service. Now, getting involved in public service doesn't just entail, I think, saying that you want to help out. It involves finding something that you are passionate about. Maybe it's a specific cause, maybe it's an organization. It doesn't always have to be elected office. For me, I'm passionate about ensuring that we have a society within every community that there is opportunity for all. And I think that to create this society, you have to have good leaders. You have to have honest, compassionate, and hardworking people who lead by example, who create good government that emphasizes these values every day. Now, Franklin County slogan is where government works, right? And the term good government, it can be vague. It can mean different things to different people. Part of my thought is, in the beauty of this state is the diversity that we have, and it's diversity of opinion, it's diversity of lifestyles, it's diversity of backgrounds. And I think that a part of being a good citizen and community member 
is developing opinions on these things. It's listening to others. It's engaging with others. It's answering simple questions like, should your taxes go up? Or what is good government in fact? And, and as I've journeyed to answer questions like this one, I've never lost sight of the responsibility instilled in me to give back. Orville mentioned that I served in an organization called the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. That was in the poorest community in the United States. And in that experience, I worked with veterans who had been denied VA benefits or weren't having success at navigating the VA system. I worked with immigrants. I worked with homeless individuals. I worked with folks who were facing evictions, the poorest of the poor. But it's in working with those people that you realize that every single person has their own life. They have their own dreams. They have their families. And they usually know what they need to improve the, their lives. And, 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 and the dreams of those folks that's what inspires me to do the work that I do every single day because experience, it shapes all of us, right? We all come from a different background. We've all taken different paths to be where we are. Uh, experience gives us empathy. It reminds us that the world is much bigger than whatever challenges or successes we face in our personal lives. You think about the opportunities for success and even the opportunities for failure that you might have in your personal life, in your career, in your community. You know, it's difficult to think that someone has two options whenever they do things, to succeed or to fail. But that's not actually true because there's a whole conversation over the course of what we do that is often forgotten. And that conversation occurs way before the potential outcome we all rush to think about so quickly. The conversation that we have begins at ensuring that all people have the opportunity to achieve success or failure. I worked in the poorest congressional district in the U.S., I saw people who weren't looking to be handed success. I saw people who were looking to have the opportunity to succeed, the opportunity to work towards their goals. And it's opportunities such as these that I believe every government official, from local to state to federal, has a duty to fight for. And through every endeavor that I have pursued, I have honored my duty and worked to enable those who need our support. Within the office I hold currently, my position as Franklin County Recorder allows me to fight for Ohioans. And sometimes people think, well, and I speak to jurors every couple of weeks, and I always ask them, do you know what the Recorder's Office does? And people might think, well, what can the Recorder's Office actually do for us? But we can do good work. And the good work that we do as a community, as a state, and as a country, it starts locally. And that's why it's so important for us to exercise what our former president, President Obama, called the most important office in this country, the office of citizen, exercising your right to vote. I think that good government starts locally. I think that it's undeniably important, maybe now more than ever, who our president is. It's important who our senators are. It's important who our governors are. It's important who represents us in Congress. But it's equally as important to know who your recorder is, who your auditor is, who your commissioners are, who your treasurers are. Local government is vital, and it is important that it forms the good government that we all seek. Because every single office, every elected official, every community, has a purpose. It comes back to why we do what we do. I do what I do because I absolutely love to serve people. And in the Franklin County Recorder's Office, when I started to seek out this office, I saw an office that needed some improvement, an office that had so much potential to implement real change in improving the lives of Ohio, and so I ran for office. Every decision that we make, whether it be to run for public office or to help your neighbor carry their groceries or to donate your time and money to a cause, it all takes making that first initial step. And this is what I did. Now, one thing that I attribute our success in the recorder's office to is for those of you who are college basketball fans, I call it the Calipari method. I get the best players and I put them on the court and let them figure out how to succeed because we have a tremendous staff at the recorder's office, whether it's on the 19th floor in the Document Imaging Center, the 18th floor in operations to our senior staff, my goal is to let talented people go to work and get the job done the best way that they know how. It is people like this who make any endeavor in public service successful. The question that I asked earlier that is very, very vital, it was why do you do what you do? And if the question, if the answer to that question is anything other than a need to serve or a desire to improve the lives of those around us, or a vision for the future that you think will do better for your community, then I think it's the wrong answer. It is this common ideal of importance in helping those around us, of improving our communities for future generations. It's this ideal that brings us all together. 
Since my time began in the recorder's office, I have been honored to be surrounded in an office full of people who share this same value. It's through this commonality that we work together to accomplish our goals. It's through this commonality that we work together to have broad and bold initiatives. These initiatives include modernizing the office so that it's functioning to the best of its ability and most accessible to those in Franklin County. This can be difficult, but change always comes with its challenges. Change is hard, change can be scary, and change is also necessary. In the end, some of the greatest developments and advancements we've seen in our society begin as an idea. One simple idea, big or small, can spark reforms and transform into vital improvements in people's lives. This is the beauty of the work that we do and the beauty of government work. It's a power we've never taken lightly in our office, and it's a responsibility I have vowed through my life to help every person who needs it. And in the recorder's office, we have implemented new initiatives to help those in Franklin County. Through our veteran ID service, we've been able to help veterans by providing them with a form of identification that connects them with resources and services. In our storage of our birth certificates, we are able to help those who might not have a safe and secure place to store their vital documents. Because wherever life takes you, we in the recorder's office believe that having a secure, easy, and accessible place to store such important documents is a resource that everyone in our community deserves. Through our Living Will Recording Service, we are able to provide comfort to all those who worry. What happens if tragedy strikes me or if I fight medical battles? How will those who I love know of my medical directives? I believe it is our duty to support those who are domestic violence survivors who are feeling unsafe, who are feeling unsafe in some place as intimate as the place they call home. That's why we intend to work with the legislature at the State House to ensure that protections are available to survivors of domestic violence where they can redact their personal information from public safety and websites. It's our work towards ensuring that discriminatory covenants that are relics of a terrible past are eliminated and all are granted the same abilities regardless of discriminatory factors so that we can help Ohioans have peace of mind with the real estate transactions. We do all of this because we have a duty to and a passion for helping others. Now, every person is going to have success and disappointments in their career, and that's a part of taking chances in the pursuit of one's goals. Sometimes these choices culminate in success, and other times the outcome doesn't go the way you hoped. Going into 2018, I was undefeated in my career in politics. And now I'm two and two after losing two elections this last year. That never means that you should stop trying. One of the main things I learned from my campaign for the United States Congress last year was that we need to keep fighting. I ran for Congress because of my deep innate desire to help people. My duty to serve and my passion for our country led me to run and it shaped the decisions I made both throughout the campaign and every single day since. Running was not and never is and never will be easy, but a lot of the time it is right. It impacted my life in immense ways. It allowed me to meet so many individuals, children and families whom I respect as my fellow Ohioans from so many different communities and backgrounds. It's these people in Franklin County and outside of it who I will never, ever, ever stop working for and fighting for. Now our state has come a long way. Our state has seen improvements and advancements, making it a great place to have grown up in, to someday hopefully raise a family in, and a great place to currently pursue success in. But it does face challenges, because the quest for our progress never will stop. As I have said, government is only as successful as its parts. Every local office and every community throughout this state matters. In the future, Franklin County must overcome the challenges associated with operating in a competent and forward-thinking way, while large parts of our state are stuck looking backwards. If those making decisions impacting our future in this state are not thinking about our future, how good can those decisions be for our collective future? The bottom line is simple, and I will be very, very blunt. Our current and past state leadership has not been forward-thinking. They have implemented policies that have cut from the very communities they are supposed to represent when local governments like ours are handed cuts in funding, we are not able to do all we aspire to do. Through this, our communities suffer, and when our communities suffer, Ohio as a whole suffers. Along with these detrimental cuts to local funding, 
our state leadership is not investing enough in the very people who would be imp impacted by these decisions, who are our children. Ohio's future generations of community members, of voters, of workers, of leaders, deserve our support, but instead are facing poor investments across this state. That is not just unfair, it is also unjust. The future that we seek in Franklin County and across this state is not impossible to obtain. It is not so far out of reach. Every single journey of innovation and progress begins with one step. Ohio needs to start making that step and continue to make steps forward. Instead of tearing down our local governments and focusing on draconian and outdated legislation like we see too often, Ohio needs to be at the forefront of implementing policies to enable our communities to journey into the future that we seek. This path forward of investing in our communities does not just mean stopping budget cuts. It means asking the wealthiest of Ohioans to do more for our communities instead of asking the poorest of our community members to do more. It means giving Ohio's children the resources that they need to succeed, the resources that they deserve. We can do better for our children because we must do better for our children. We must invest in a future that ensures every child, no matter their situation, can look forward to a shot at the American dream. We in Franklin County and beyond need to start thinking proactively instead of continuing the disservice of thinking reactively. This begins at the local level, taking root in individual communities and spreading across our state. The future of Ohio and Franklin County begins every single day with the choices that we make for our children and for our communities. It is up to us in this room as public service, as public servants to make choices about this future. Now public service from the elected side, which you mentioned, it's not a field that you get into lightly. You could ask my fiance what it's like to have reporters call you at work and have people follow you around all the time. As a public servant, you have to know not only what change is needed, but also how to implement that change effectively. No matter the office or the level of government, each person has a specific role that they must play for the overall functioning of our government. As a public servant, you can never forget those who you serve, those who elected you and those who rely on your leadership. Through the office that I hold, I've been fortunate enough to fight for people. I've been fortunate enough to not have to forget the people who I served in those poor communities. I've been fortunate enough to know that there are 1.3 million and growing people who rely on our office to do good work. They need us to make decisions to ensure that the future that they dream of is possible. I've never forgotten the poorest among us who even amid the trials and tribulations of their lives never lost sight of their dreams. And I've never forgotten the voices of every Ohioan I've met in my pursuits in Franklin County and outside of Franklin County, those who agree with me and those who don't, who just want a fair shot. It's these people who shape me, who shape all of us who serve. They impact our lives just as they impact our service. And we all must hope to better theirs. Now, I'm open to any uh, questions or, or feedback or anything. I know, Orville, you mentioned that you had some questions and stuff, so, um, but fire away. I'm happy to discuss anything. I'd like to take it from the audience first because I can, um, I have like tons of questions for him. Yes? Beverly? You mentioned that you came to the office that you came to. Oftentimes, when you go into the county office, there's a lot of time to staff. So, how did the staff react to the county office and how were you able to tell them? Sometimes it's the wrong way. Yeah, so, so we recognize that there was a fantastic cadre of institutional knowledge, folks who'd been serving the community for a very, very, very long time who uh, really are just very, very good at the work that they do. If you talk to folks who interact with our office on a daily basis, uh, they'll tell you that our customer service desk is absolutely fantastic at dealing with any type of situation that might arise. Our recording services desk is fantastic at dealing with some of the nuances of the work that we do. Uh, so relying on the good and getting rid of the bad was an absolutely vital part of this process. You know, we recognize uh, like with any team, that there can be improvements that are made. And, uh, you know, we had some things that we needed to fix. Some of our metrics when we took office were pretty far behind, and we wanted to turn those around. But 
uh, by allowing an invigoration of new leadership and of new ideas and reforms, but also relying heavily on senior staff and, and people who had been there for a long time, we were able to kind of create a, a really good mix of, uh, you know, to use a sports analogy, veteran leadership, but also uh, rookie presences. Let me follow up on that question. Um, when you arrived at the office, recorder's office, what most impressed you about the staff that you, be, that became part of your team when you arrived? What yeah, most impressed you? I mean, the, the knowledge on some very, very, very intricate details. I mean, when, when you are talking about the recording of deeds and titles and mortgages, these are sometimes documents that are dealing with uh, millions, if not billions of dollars worth of transactions. And uh, the, the recognition of when things needed to be changed, the recognition of um, you know, how much stress I think our customers have on them with this fast moving real estate market uh, just really, really impressed us and a willingness to uh, move forward in a different direction. You know, whenever an office changes hands like mine did, that's always going to be a period of consternation and of difficulty for folks who are, have been serving through multiple different administrations. And I think that by going in and, and listening and having, um, you know, an earnest desire to uh, hear the voices of people who've been there for a very, very long time. I think that that combination of, of, like I said before, the new leadership, but also the relying on the veteran presence was very, very important. Good. Appreciate that. Um, another question? Um, just following up on that point, I made a call to your office um, to uh, shortly after you had taken the office. It, it really, you hadn't been there very long. And I had a, a kind of a complicated question about what to do with some property that was in my dad's name. And my dad was very, very sick at the time and he did ultimately pass away. But in your staff was just so extremely helpful. They called, they made follow-up call um, because they were checking out the information. They were just super, and their manner was so helpful. And I just was wondering if you would talk a little bit about you know, the leadership style that it takes to be able to create that culture that is able to be so responsive. Yeah, so, uh, you, know, you know, I'm a big believer that if, if there are talented and skilled people to just let them do their job and not, you know, there's, there's micromanagement, right, which a lot of people do and doesn't always work well. Uh, and then there's making sure that you give people the tools that they need to succeed. And, you know, I would be, foolish to, to go to, to Eric or Judy and, and folks at our customer service desk and tell them how to handle the type of inquiry that you made that day. Because it's my job to lead the office when it comes to our initiatives and our budgets and decision making uh, processes that we have to put in place. But uh, you know, for, for me, recognizing that we had so many talented people while changing the way that our executive uh, um, senior staff was functioning. I think allowed for the change to occur uh, in a very, very fast way. And, and it wouldn't have been possible without the very, very, very committed folks that we have uh, who've been here in some cases for 20 or 30 years. And, and you know, comments like yours about the feedback and the interaction folks have, it's very, very common. I mean, I spend a lot of time talking to folks in the real estate community, talking to title agents, title attorneys, and uh, on a weekly basis, you know, people relay the positive interactions that they have with my staff, and, and it's fantastic. And one thing that's great too is, and I know, uh, you know, some of the folks who are here deal with a lot of veterans who come into our office, and, and we've had veterans who are World War II generation up to, you know, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan war on terror generation veterans, and um, it's always great to see the respect that they're given when they come to their office for to our office for a same day ID. I like to mention to folks who are veterans, you know, there's a federal ID, but there's ours, and, and if you like to wait for things to come in the mail for three weeks, you know, maybe the federal ID is for you, but if you like to get one on the same day, you should come to the recorder's office because they, they do a great job and, and, and really take care of folks. But, you know, anytime that I'm there and, and, and available, I love to go out and talk to those folks, and it's great to see the interaction between our front desk staff and people who've served our country. Yeah. Go ahead. I would like to challenge, in light of what you just said, your basketball analogy about Calipari, who's more like a one and done, <laughs> and suggest that you consider maybe more of, of like what Tony Bennett has done at the University of Virginia. <laughs> so it's a two-part question. First part, you can defend that or change your mind, as I would advise. And secondly, how does a public servant um, 
stay true to his or her beliefs while without, as a basketball coach might, pander to the, to the will of, of the fans and, and their following? Well, I'm glad the, the recorder's office has never lost to a 16 seed like uh, Tony Bennett did last year. But, uh, and, and if national champions, championships were rewarded for recorder's offices, we would have, I think we would have run our, won our third in a row. Uh, this last year so we got Virginia beat there too but um, you know in terms of, of staying true I think that having a, a strong I mean look I mean I'm not perfect no one is perfect especially not people who are in the public realm and a lot of times we learn that very very quickly right I mean you know there's there's a lot of scrutiny and there's a lot of pressure in this business but um, you know knowing why you're doing this is important thinking about the stories that you hear as you pursue public office I think is something that keeps you grounded. I mean, when I ran in, a, in this very, very contested 2018 cycle, I mean, people would say mean things. People would come to me and share that the day before they had been diagnosed with cancer and that they were fighting back against that through a treatment program and stuff. And, and keeping those stories you know, in, in the back of your mind and, and more often than you can in the forefront of your mind is something that keeps you true. But whenever you're in public service, uh, and, and you're an elected official, sometimes, uh, you know, some people tend to forget how they got there and, and what caused them to do that at the beginning. And I think that by having a good staff and having folks who keep you grounded and are honest with you, and I hope that all of you who work for an elected official here, I hope you're always honest with them and never tell them what they want to hear. Sometimes I wish my staff told me what I want to hear, um, but it's important to have that type of respectful dialogue with all of your employees. Um, but uh, almost more importantly with the public. Recorder, so just to follow up on that, one point you mentioned that you would hope that your staff come to you and ex not just say yes, but to provide their opinion. Uh, I know most of us have experienced that once you're in office for so, um, a period of time, that kind of dissipates. You, you, you begin to be less approachable and it's harder for someone to share that opinion with you. And I'm hoping that you uh, are able to, re to keep that in, you know, in the front of your mind and uh, can continue to encourage them to come and talk with you. So my next question was, um, not going to talk about Virginia because I was impressed with Virginia, Virginia as well. It was, it was great. <laughs> that was a great analogy. That's my mom that asked that question. So. Oh, and that was a great analogy. I'm like, she knew it all. Um, and it was a great leadership story coming from six, losing to the 16th and then winning. Okay, so we, we missed that piece. But I want to know if anyone in the, in the audience here would like to be on a committee or something that you have at your office that they can serve the public in, in that way within your office. Are there any committees that the public can be on or that public servants can be on in your office? Yeah, I, you know, we're, we're always looking for ways that we can expand um, our reach to veterans. Uh, so if you have ideas for different communities where we can have conversations with veterans about us directing them towards resources with mental health situations, with legal situations, we're happy to do that. Our uh, Living Will initiative is one that's taken me to churches and communities of faith because talking about end of life issues, uh, are, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's not always the most enjoyable conversation, but it's an important one for people to have. Uh, with their family members. So if you have a community that you think we could come to and, and have that conversation with and answer questions for, uh, we're more than happy to do that. Okay. All right. Yes. So um, talking about living wills, is it still true that public employees can file their living wills yeah. for free? Yeah, with our office. Yeah. And what is the cost if you're not a public servant? Right now we're waiving them, but normally it's uh, $40. Because we, I mean, we want people from all different communities to be able to access this. And a lot of times, the people who need it the most are folks who are poor and folks who don't have the money to have an estate attorney who holds on to it for when that type of situation arises. So uh, I always tell people that a living will for it to be valid, it does not have to be filed with us. But someone needs to know it's there. Because if you fill it out and don't tell anyone, chances are you'll be in a situation where you can't give the directive anyway. Uh, so if you if you work uh, you know if you fill it out with the guidance of a pastor or a religious leader, or you know if you do have an attorney or a, or a banker or someone who's trusted who's going to hang on to it, we encourage people to do that. 
Um, you mentioned your time as a volunteer um, in the Bronx and that you work with veterans and, and the poorest of poor. Tell us a story or a memory that you had at that time when you interacted with one of the individuals or one of the groups. Mm -hmm. So there's two stories that I, I think of, and I, I never, um, I don't think I ever shared these last year. Um, so this is the first time I've told anyone. But there was a man who um, came to our office. Um, I, I'm not going to say his name because of confidentiality, but he was in the Marine Corps in the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. Everybody know what the Tet Offensive was? It was a very, very violent battle in the Vietnam War. And um, he was wounded a couple times, and he received a Bronze Star, um, and I think with a V for Valor. And when he came home in 1968, I think he, he got home in mid-1968 um, after the Tet Offensive, because that was in January, um, he had a job at the New York Times on the printing floor. Right, this, I mean, they, the roles of printing and all that. And it was a union job, so it paid well. It had good benefits. It had a pension. And about four or five years after he got back, and he, you know, he got married, had two babies. And about four or five years after uh, he got home, he couldn't go to sleep anymore because he was so terrified. He, he had post-traumatic stress disorder that came back a few years down the line. And this is about 1975. Um, and I know the date so well because we worked on his case um, in, a, in a vigorous manner. But, uh, you know, he couldn't fall asleep. So because he couldn't fall asleep, he would finally fall asleep when he could, which sometimes was at work. And even though he had a good job, you know, we didn't understand what he had gone through at that point as a country, the way that we hopefully do now, although we don't do enough about it. Um, and he lost his job. And he lost his job and he turned to... Uh, alcohol and he turned to drugs and, and then he lost his family and he turned to life on the streets he was homeless and and he came to us in um, in uh, early 2010 uh, I remember working with him and and just told me his story and, and and what had happened to him and when someone comes in who you know was wounded in Vietnam and was decorated for valor in Vietnam who came home and was forgotten by our country, that kind of pisses you off a little bit, right? I mean, it, it makes you upset, and it makes you want to fight back for people like that. And, 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 and in some ways, you know, I always thought, well, I loved history. I loved the news. I thought, you know, I'd run for office someday. I didn't think I'd run countywide at 29 um, like I did. Uh, I didn't think I would do the congressional thing like I just did. I thought I'd, you know, get married, have some kids, you know, and then run for something you know, uh, down the line, but, but something like that happens and you start to think, you know what, like, if I can do something about this stuff, I will do something about this stuff. And so that's a story that I've carried with me a lot um, because it was so personal. I mean, I worked very, very closely with him and, and he, he, he had all the rights to VA health care and VA benefits and he didn't know how to do it. And he was afraid to ask. And when he came to us, we said, we'll take it from here. And sometimes, like, I mean, government shouldn't do everything, right? But if we can do something, we have to do something, especially for people like that. And then the second story I think of, and this is very, very poignant because it's Lent, and as someone who is, you know, a, a practicing Catholic and uh, proud to be Catholic, I remember um, on Ash Wednesday, um, we, you know, uh, the place, the legal clinic I worked at, it started out as a soup kitchen. So people would come and, you know, get their meals and, They'd wait in line, you know, out the door and on the street. And, and the simple uh, task that I was given on Ash Wednesday was to go to the homeless individuals who were waiting in line and offer them the ability to have their ashes put on their forehead. And for me, that was a very, very, very uh, human experience to have that type of connection with individuals from so many different walks of life who were coming uh, to get food, to get uh, a shower, to get legal help, to get dental help, to get... Uh, to check their mail because they, you know, if you're homeless, where are you going to check your mail if you don't have an address, if you don't have a, a, a mailbox? Um, that was a, a very, very, very um, human experience for me and, and one that meant a lot. So those are, I mean, there's so many. Another story was, it was uh, right before Christmas in 2009, uh, there was a woman who was a uh, uh, undocumented immigrant who was working two jobs in the Upper East Side in New York, which is the wealthiest part of this country. She's living in the poorest part of the country, 
but working two jobs in the wealthiest part of the country. And she lived in a apartment building that was eight units. And what had happened was the landlord assigned the entirety of the gas bill to her one unit. So her gas bill is what, I mean, whatever a normal gas bill is in New York times eight. I mean, uh, over a thousand dollars. And it's a couple months and he's saying he's going to evict her for not paying this. And she comes to us and, and I remember just talking to her about what she was going through. And I remember, I mean, she's holding a rosary, she's crying. And at one point she says, to, you know, I ask her, I'm trying to have a conversation with her. I say, well, you have kids? And she's got three kids. One of them was a junior who had a 4.2 GPA at a Catholic school. And one thing she said to me, she said, Danny, I know that I don't have a future in this country, but I do everything I do so that my children can have a future in this country. And that's the type of stuff where when you hear that, you can't not fight for people. You can't not go to work for people. And that woman should not have to say that. She should have a future in this country. But the self-sacrifice and the commitment that she displayed and demonstrated to me while dealing with her on that, um, it was remarkable. I mean, there, it's, there's story after story, and those are just three that I, that I think of. But um, thank you for asking that, because uh, I think, I don't know if I've told anybody that. Mm. Those. Yeah, thank you. Any questions? I have a final question. Um, <clears throat> tell us about one or two people that's mentored you in your life and a takeaway, a life, a life lesson that they um, gave you that you took away and that you're using now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that um, my parents have really impacted me in, in, in a great way. I mean, they've, they've been committed to service for um, as long as I can remember. Uh, they're obviously not afraid of, you know, asking me tough questions, uh, as we saw here. Um, but, you know, th they've imparted on me, I think, a foundation that allows me to go forth and do the best I can for people in a, in a couple different, whether it's as a lawyer or as the recorder or, you know, most recently as a candidate. Um, that earnestness and desire to help people comes from them. Uh, they've been a good example. You know, I haven't always been perfect. I haven't always lived up to their example. Uh, I think we rarely do live up to the example of our mentors or people who we look up to. But the key for us, I think, as human beings is to learn from our failures and learn from areas where we didn't have success and try and win the next time out. And, and they've always been strong, strong, strong supporters. And then, I mean, honestly, the, the person I admire the most in my life is my fiance. Uh, you know, I get married in 45 days. Um, I, don't, I don't know how I got her to do this. Uh, you know, I, I asked her to marry me in the middle of a congressional campaign. And, you know, it, it's something when you're, you know, you're, you're meeting with your wedding photographer and she sees a black and white scary picture of you on TV as an attack ad and, and, and you know, going through all that and, and everything. But, but she's just a, 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 tremendous, a tremendous person and a, a person of, of faith and, and has just a good moral compass. We're a bipartisan household because she grew up a Republican, and I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat, but she's, um, you know, she's, she's just a, a great, and I know some of our, she's a, a title attorney, uh, so she works with our office, and I know that some of our folks here in the office, Eric and Judy, have, have dealt with her, and, and you know, I, I, she's just, she's remarkable, but she's a new, I mean, she's a more recent entry into my life, you know, she wasn't with me over the Bronx and, and all those different things, but, um, you know, she's, she's definitely a, someone I look up to. All right. Thank you. Any final points? Not at all. Well, can you help me thank him for coming thank today? Thank you.